We have a really uh, cool guest uh, with us today for uh, kind of a Katsu interview with uh, his experience uh, with Katsu and how he's used it in his sport. Coach uh, John T. Skinner is joining us today, former world record holder, NCAA champion, international hall of famer, was a coach uh, at Alabama for a long time. John T. has worked with a lot of emerging technology in the sport of swimming. And I think that's really why Steven and Jonti's relationship with respect to Katsu has really uh, blossomed over the years. That is our guest today, Jonti. It's uh, awesome, awesome to have you uh, on board today. Thank you for joining us. Well, you're welcome. And you know, I've known Steve for, for eons for a long time. So, um, you know, I was always, something you know you're right about me i've always been someone that was has been very interested in anything that is new or different or could change how we see the sport or how we develop the sport or develop athletes and i'm always looking for that next paradigm that i think is going to make a difference in the long run and you know in from my int initial introduction to it with uh, john and and steve in florida that very first time um, and some of the initial uses that I used it for in Alabama, it really evolved to some degree to how I used it in Indiana. So, um, and, I, and I spent a year in Indiana kind of with the new devices, the really more portable the little boxes that I thought were really convenient. My transition went from um, more of a, a training kind of tool um, to more of a skill adaptation tool. So today I'm going to talk more about how I use it in skill adaptation. And to preface that is, is to understand how the brain manages movement, how the brain really I try to teach athletes that even though they're athletes and they think of the heart and lungs as the most important organs that we use in performance, the reality is it's actually the most important organ is the brain. Because the more exposure, the more opportunity we give the brain uh, exposure to the patterns of movement that they want to use or will utilize in racing and how to manage that pattern of movement, the more, uh, the more skilled it is at reproducing what you want when you're at the point where you want it the most, which is in racing. In my line of work and as a college coach, I found that pretty much 90% of the athletes that came into my environment needed to learn new skills. And in some cases, I had to reteach them how to swim freestyle. Like they just didn't understand it. Their technique was, um, to use an, a, a euphemism, abysmal. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it just it was just start from scratch. And the way the brain works is the brain wants to be on autopilot. Uh, we, we think of the left and right hemispheres as controlling left and right side um, actions of the body, but the reality is the left hemisphere is controls everything that we know. Basically, it's the automation center of all the skill that we know. Um, the right hemisphere is all about exploration. It's metaphor. It's music. It's a whole different environment. When you learn something new, a completely new pattern, you have to be. You have to trick the brain into getting into the right hemisphere, which is a challenge in itself because it doesn't want to do that. It just wants to do what it knows. And once you trick it to get in there to learn new patterns, now you're in the process of teaching the brain how to manage a completely new pattern at the adult stage, which requires probably a time frame of anywhere from six months if you're extremely lucky to probably out to almost two years before that skill acquisition can be honed into where it becomes automated and becomes very good and you can build strength, power, and performance in that new pattern. So it takes a long time. Um, I've done this many, many times with athletes, and I have a very strong repertoire of uh, tricks and tools in my toolbox that I use to trick the brain to learn something new. As Katsu evolved in this past year, uh, I kind of evolved into how I used Katsu. And this is the way I was using it. If I was, you know, I'm going to push the computer back a little, but if I had learned to do a pattern of movement was it, that was only in this direction, and I had to change that completely and change it to more of a cutting direction, now this is completely new. 
And as my brain began to learn how this new cutting direction was managed, the iterations of paths that it might follow would be very wide, which means there'd be a lot of noise associated with the pattern, which would create a lot of loss of energy and power. So the, the drive on my end was to create a, an environment where I could accelerate the brain's process of learning the acquisition of the pattern and hone it down to where it was exactly the same pattern every time. Because once you get there and the brain can manage the movement, it reduces the number of motor units associated with managing the movement, cost goes down, and then eventually you build strength and power on top of that. I have found that in order to accelerate the process of skill acquisition, I use a concept called contrast training. So in contrast training, what I do is I put the athletes into the environment where I provide resistance and I slow the pattern down to where it's meticulous, to where they are very meticulous about following a specific pattern of movement with resistance because the brain is very, very much better at learning with resistance back there. And then I might put little tricks or tools in there to add to make the brain think, okay, this is clearly something new. I have to really focus on what I'm doing so that I can master this new pattern because I want to get this down because I don't want to have to deal with it anymore. So by adding resistance to the movement, what I did was I would marry the contrast between perfect, resistant, meticulous patterns, and then I flip right from that to high-intensity swimming. So race intensity swimming. So the same pattern, but extremely fast. And I asked the swimmers not to kind of focus specifically on what that pattern was, because I didn't want them to do that. I didn't want them to be encumbered by it. I just wanted to have a sense of, okay, this is what I want to do, and then let them go. And what I found that is by contrast training, that the, the process of learning the new pattern or adapting or acquiring the new skill was enhanced. It was accelerated. So then I began to say, wait a second, if I add the katsu to the slow, meticulous pattern and did, did the katsu in that phase and then took katsu off and put them into that high-intensity fast swimming, what it did was it really helped the swimmer coming off the katsu. Not only did they feel good, which in my mind had a, a, had a cognitive mind-based component, this feels really good, um, but it also, in my opinion, just added to that process of acceleration because the worst thing that happens when you make a change with an athlete and you try to put them into an environment where you're learning a skill acquisition that is new, it is similar to what you wanted it to be, but it's new enough to where it creates a difference in, in opportunity and potential, but it's close enough to where the brain says, no, 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 I really want this. This doesn't interest me at all. So if you employ and you get environments where the actual cognitive thinking mind actually says, oh, actually, I think this feels good. I like it it makes the brain a little more aware of like, okay, maybe it's something we should keep. We should learn how to understand this and keep it. So by adding the katsu to that element of contrast training during the methodical resistance phase, I feel like I was enhancing the process of learning. You know, and then, folks, I use it for recovery. I use it for athletes to get ready to race. I've used it in a lot of different areas that are normal ways that we use katsu. But this was the, the, the most recent way I was employing it in terms of skill acquisition and the rationale behind why I used it that way for skill acquisition. I have a question. So you've already obviously been focused on swimmers, which just swimming is a very technical uh, movement. You're also golfing now, a sport that isn't your chosen uh, mm -hmm. line of work. Um, could, you, could you use it for everything from golfing to let's say physical rehabilitation, if you've got, uh, uh, you know, a total knee replacement or what have you. I, I, absolutely. I think it, you know, to me, it's, it's a combination of that, the physical, right. How the brain kind of deals with the circumstance that you're dealing with. Right. So this is the physical brain dealing with any circumstance. 
and then this relationship of that cognitive thinking mind, that the psychology of the situation that adds to the element of if someone feels good, it becomes important. And if it's important, the brain is going to take notice of it. So to me, like as a golfer, and, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm six foot five. So golfing, you know, it's more for like people around six feet, somewhere in that range, because it's a little more compact, movement's easier to manage. I played golf with a, a, a good, very good baseball player the other day, and I said, okay, give me the news. What's, what's, what's worse, trying to deal with a 100-mile-hour fastball or hitting a golf ball? And he just shook his head. He said, this, this is no contest. It's hitting a golf ball. He said, and the worst thing about it is the golf ball is just sitting there. <laughs> so, you know, I spent probably, I've been, as trying to learn this game of golf and becoming better at it, I, I know and understand that I have to develop a process of a pattern of takeaway and movement, which is all over the place, especially when you're six, five. Those iterations are huge. You know, and I'm just learning how takeaway and patterns are involved in steering the ball in the right direction kind of thing. But to me, if I kind of work my swing plane without even a golf ball, not even I don't even need a golf ball there. I just need to be working with the patterns with right resistance on katsu and then take everything off and come back to swinging at the speeds that I need to swing at. Because when I swing slow patterns, I can really manipulate and control the pattern. Um, versus not with the pattern. So I feel like, you know, it has both this physiological, neurological, and then on the same end, if you are if you kind of understand how it works with athletes, this whole psychological, cognitive thinking, feel-good process that, you know, to give you an example, the very first time I asked a swimmer to put katsu bands on for, I said, you can wear them for 10 minutes in the warm-up, uh, at the time, we were working with a katsu's a pressure of about two-thirds of her normal working pressure. And I said, just put them on your legs, you know, watch the clock, do your normal warm-up, take them off after 10 minutes. She did. She put them on the side of the deck. She came out to wa- out after warm-up. She goes, oh, my God, I feel awesome. I just feel mm-hmm. freaking awesome. Mm-hmm. Now, was that katsu or was that the cognitive thinking mind saying, we're going to kick ass today, mm-hmm. you know? You know, to me, you cannot have one without the other. You cannot be exclusive in the physical, neural um, side and not, you know, encounter what this cognitive thinking, psychological side is adding to the equation. Uh, what are these sets that you're doing from the, you know, reducing the noise of, of you know, that, that we encounter to a high intensity? Are you talking like 400 meters something in the 4100s or what are you talking about no no in a non-katsu environment so if i'm not if they don't have katsu on um and i might i could work on the entire spectrum of swimming so you know swimming at slow speeds all the way up to swimming at race speeds there's this this curve there's this continuum and you have to be sort of on the path of that continuum so I would do something like four to six twenty fives with resistance, maybe with small paddles on, methodical, perfect patterns of movement with total focus. A lot of times if they're freestyles, there's a snorkel on, so they don't have to worry about dealing with breathing or anything else. And then they just focus on the perfect patterns. And then I flip that and that would do maybe four seventy fives if I'm working with a VO to max level with the appropriate amount of rest and then come back and do it again, just do it again, just flip-flop between the two. And that's working with a VO2 max environment. Um, If I wanted to do a pure speed environment or race rate type environment, then I would do the resistance and then they would be swimming 25s at race rate. And I would keep the load, uh, the contrast levels, probably the resistance levels somewhere between 100 and 150 yards, always in 25s. And then the performance side, depending on the, the, the energy system I'm trying to hit, I might be out as far as 875s if I'm looking at the endurance kind of cardiovascular component, all the way down to 4 to 625s if I'm looking at the speed component. So it depend on what component I'm working on. But that's where I would do it in a, 
a non-katsu. When I included the katsu to it, I only worked with the speed side. I didn't do the endurance side. I never had time enough to play with the speed side because the, the idea didn't really click into my mind until late October, uh, late November, early December when I was actually changing gears and starting to get my athletes really into that race rate you know, getting the brain exposure to just being able to manage race rate with new patterns, new power, new strength, new, you know, things, and just honing that side in prior to performance at the Big Tens and then nothing happened beyond that. So it's an area that I think is really worth exploration more than I've even explored it. Um, but I've spent a lot of time uh, really studying neuroscience and Mostly on it, don't get confused. I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm just, I'm a person that has read a lot about neuroscience. I feel like it is truly the next paradigm in performance because when you truly understand how the brain manages and organizes and deals with patterns of movement, then you, you, you go, you change gears on how you train people. Because you now think you now understand. Okay, I'm not training the heart and the lungs. They're sort of byproduct. I'm now training the brain, and and I'm training the brain how to manage all these other things. And then you create the environments where you expose the brain to all the elements that it needs to be exposed to, in order to put itself in a position where the expectation and the anticipation on race day is meets your, your goal performance. And, and really, because I'm one of these people that are always evolving and thinking, and when I learn something new, like I'm just reading, um, I'm just in the process of reading a book called Physical Intelligence, which I find really intriguing and interesting, you know, and then all these thoughts and these notes that I write down as the big book evolves, and then I go back and look at stuff from before. So, you know, it took me a while to kind of come back and say, okay, um, contrast training came out of a book called um, uh, Motor Cortex. And that concept was really more about the sport of baseball. It had nothing really to do with swimming. But in reading it, it made a lot of, you know, a lot of and increased my understanding of because I'm always in this process of helping kids learn to manage better movement, skill acquisition type thing. Um, it made absolute sense to me. So in putting katsu and marrying katsu into that process made a lot of sense and didn't come till late. That's why, you know, I never, I never went more than four to six 25s to do the pattern uh, rehearsal. And then I never really went, you know, more than, you know, with the katsu, more than four to six 25s, just working at velocity. And I would, they, this would be the sort of sequence that I would go. Um, I would do a katsu sequence of 425s where they have the resistance. And then I'd flip them out of that and I'd put one pound weights on their wrists. And uh, I would make them some 425s at weight velocity with one pound race weights on their wrists because I feel like the, it is just getting the brain to deal with different dynamics. Right, and I'd right, right. chill, come back and add uh, some katsu with the same format and then go back to weights with fins and paddles so then just keeping them just different things at that velocity getting very comfortable with it and then come back and do it with nothing on to where i maybe go the first 225s with the equipment on and then the last 22 the last 225 the last 225s with nothing on to slowly take the brain out of um dealing with these other elements while performing at this high intensity at race velocity and then taking them down to race velocity. I think when they got to those last 225s, you know, they just felt good. They just, if you take the weights off and then you start swimming, you feel good. So I was marrying the feel yeah. good that you get from katsu to the feel good that you get after using weights to this whole cognitive belief system that just says, this is awesome. And you've potentially turned on a whole, fired up a whole you separate do, you do, you section do. of the brain. You do, because honestly, you know, one of the things that I don't think coaches truly understand is the importance of exposing the brain, constantly exposing the brain to different dynamics, different things, you know, just something to just get it out of its comfort zone to start opening up and saying, wow, okay, I need to change gears. I, I, I'm fascinated by this because when we have guys that have massive TBI, let's say, and they can't move their hand or they have it like 
clenched up in the fist. Then they put the katsu bands on into cycle mode and the therapists help them. And sometimes it only takes five or 10 minutes and then they're moving. Now, I'm not talking a spinal cord injury. I'm talking a, a, a brain injury. So with that autonomic nervous system response like that, and that's what you're doing, that you're, you're, you're working in that space with competitive uh, athletes, which is yeah, it's somewhat similar. awesome. Yeah. I imagine it would there'd be no question that you'd have your kids into that, those environments. You know, if they had them on swim benches or pulley systems or tubing with cut, you know, that would maintain the functional power that they had when they were in the pool on a constant basis. Eight of my kids were very dedicated to using katsu during the time, um, doing simple things like adding katsu bands to their dry land practice, um, doing, and Steven saw it, I had kids in endless pools using katsu bands in the open water using katsu bands because our time was a lot less. And what I have written down in a very, very scientific way in a, in a notebook and, and pencil is we are now in the pool and my kids are not as fit as they were before. They're more fit. I believe that they're faster than they ever were. Now I think that there's an element that they actually have recovered a little bit from just being broken from, from me and kind of the old school side of swimming. But um, I have kids who after four months of not touching water, a best time of a 146, 200 yard freestyle going 149 in practice. So they're, uh, I'm blown away at how fit they are right now. I don't know if Steve, if that answers it, but yeah. just we've been using Katsu um, more than before and and it's it's incredible because aerobically I feel like they're they haven't lost very much. The more the more, especially in this past year, the more I felt the val where the value of katsu came in when you're actually in the pool was this whole where I've evolved and advanced to where it is managing and understanding and building power and strength in patterns of movement. So I don't think it matters what distance you swim. I think it matters when you train with katsu, what distances you swim. And I don't think it's necessary for, I mean, I might hypoth hypothetically say I would katsu a swimmer and then maybe the distance swimmers would swim, you know, maybe 650s or 850s. Uh, to me, it's just about exposing the brain to what it's managing and how it's going to manage it and then marrying the two together in that contrast style. So, you know, doesn't matter the distance, doesn't matter um, the athlete physiology. I think the process would be fairly similar up and down the chain. So I, I love the concept of this whole mental part of the training and um, the idea of neuroplasticity. I, I highly recommend that's what I was trying to do while you guys were talking about it. There's a book called The Brain That Changes Itself. I don't know if any of you have ever yes. read that. Fabulous. Audio book. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, again, I've, I've done it both ways, but there's also a video on you on, uh, I think it's Amazon Prime about it. But, you know, mm -hmm. the concept, especially to us in westernized medicine, is so foreign. I mean, it, it's kind of taken off recently. But, you know, my father had a major stroke, and I wish I would have known some of these con concepts of, you know, him concentrating on the paralyzed side rather than, you know, um, so I like the concept. I have not honestly used those and, and you being, like I say, I'm a triathlete cause I'm trying to be an athlete. I, I pretty much suck at everything. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I really like the concepts of her getting older. And as you, you know, get into your late fifties, it becomes more of a challenge to stay active. And I really like the idea and concept of Katsu allowing me to do that. And, to hopefully even improve. I mean, I may not necessarily get a whole lot faster, but at least maintain. And uh, these are new concepts for me. Um, I'm a big visualization person. Again, I'm terrible at golf too, so I may have to try my katsu with my golf swing. But I, I love these concepts and ideas uh, from elite people like yourselves. Yeah, uh, John T. Just so you know, when when I first met uh, Dr. Sato. Um, he separated katsu into three areas, three basic areas. One was the katsu cycle. So for the warm up, rehabilitation, warm down, katsu training, which is, you know, just constant pressure. 
But he also had a third area. And um, it, was, it was more difficult for me to get the information out of him because it was applied by the elite baseball, swimming, uh, wrestling, et cetera, coaches in Japan. And he called it performance training. And performance training for him with Katsu was almost exactly what you described, you know, purposeful movement or mind. He called it something like mindful movement with Katsu. Yeah. Yeah. And then he would, but he didn't, he didn't go back. What they didn't do is they didn't go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. They didn't, what they did was mindful movement and then uh, race pace or, you know, whatever that movement was. They just did it once and twice. And I really like, you know, you're going back and forth and back and forth to eliminate that noise and make that perfect movement. I think this that's ex- brilliant. This ex- accelerates. The, it's just, it's, it's, it's the learning process. Yeah. And, it, and it's hard. It's not easy. I mean, I've done this years for years and years and years as a coach. You know, uh, when I, I would, I would work for, I work for USA Swimming and I would show up at someone's pool, some university and, and film athletes and I'd sit down with the coach and the athlete and I'd take them through all the things that are, are, were glaring errors. I mean, I'm called glaring errors. And they'd both sit there and go, wow, I had no idea that was going on. Yes, we got to change that. I'd give them some basic drills to help them change. And then I'd come back a month later. I'd see them in a competition a month later. And guess what? Same thing. Nothing had changed, right? So, you know, it wasn't a motor. It wasn't this year. Like as coaches, we think of a motor thing, you know, it had to be here. You know, so that's what led me to the very first book I read was Norman Doidge's The Brain That Changes Itself. Okay. It was the very first book I read. Awesome. And then from there, you know, that expanded to books and books and books on the brain and how it manages movement and that thinking. And then I'm one of those lucky people that I've had this pool of guinea pigs in front of me that I just kind of threw stuff at him and, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with one funny anecdote, but I always, so, you know, coaches have this, uh, swimming coaches have this problem as they relate the way a shape moves through water. They always talk about the hand and it's, you know, we're wired for hands and feet. We're absolutely wired for hands and feet uh, in terms of neurology, but they always talk about the hand moving past the bottom. When we talk about patterns of movement, we always relate it that way. A coach might stand on deck and go, put your hand in the water this way, get a high elbow position, you know, and then the hand will move past the body as the coach traces the pattern. Well, the problem with that is the brain sort of wants to do it the same way. Instead, the coach should put the hand in the water and, the, and you basically walk his body past the hand following the same patterns of changes in movement. That's the mistake. So. You know, the, the idea is that um, I, I, I wanted the kids to become more aware of their shape. I wanted them to become more aware of the flow of water around their shape. I, I wanted them to be sensitized to it. So I had this, I think it was a 10-year-old boy at the time. And I cut a whole bunch of these nylon strings. I mean, a whole bunch of them, you know. And I taped them onto his shoulders so they were flowing down his body and his legs on both sides. And I put a pair of fins on him, and I just wanted him to go down the pool, up and down the pool, and then come back to me and say, do you feel, do you feel what's going on with these, these, these bands? I wanted the brain to become sensitized to these, these strands of string as they float around his body. At the same time, I was watching and filming on deck, watching how they changed based on the vortices as they came off his body. Well, to cut a long story short, what I used initially, very first day one, I used duct tape to put them on his shoulders. <laughs> well, that left this huge red welt on his shoulders. So I'm like, when he puts his shirt on at the end of practice, I say, son, do not take your shirt off at home and don't tell your mom about your shoulders. <laughs> but, you know, and the other, the other time when I took that to British swimming and I had a really elite level breaststroke, I mean, he was on the British Olympic team. And I had taped this on his pecs, and I had Kitec tape at that time, so I had a non-invasive tape on him. So I put this this Kitec tape with all these strands coming down because he's a breaststroker, and I wanted him to kind of feel flow. Well, I got him all taped up, 
with the, the Kitec taste on his chest. It happened to be pink at the time, unfortunately, all these tassels hanging down and all I got were hoots, cat whistles and whistles from the kids in the audience. It looked like some kind of belly dancer. I mean, I still feel like it's a crucial concept for when swimmers start to realize that understanding that they, how their shape moves through water and the feel of how that, the flow of water over that shape. And if we can sensitize people to kind of sense that, then I think they change the paradigm of how they manipulate their anchoring positions as they vault the shape through the water. Do you ever use a higher pressure or lower pressure to achieve what you want to achieve? How, how does pressure play a part of this? The pressure played a part in that, I, you know, when I chose the pressure for contrast katsu, I went with the same um, concept that when originally when I had kids warm up with a katsu band on their legs, um, at the time in talking with Chris and yourself, the, 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 the rule of thumb was go to two thirds of their training pressure. So that's what I did. If they were training with 240, they went to like 180 or somewhere in that range. And, you know, if they felt like that still wasn't the right comfort, I let them go lower because they ultimately I want them to kind of have this great feeling. It, it, it had more of a cognitive thinking, psychological plus, um, even though we know that it has physiological, you know, what it does physiologically to the, the flow. Um, so I went with that same premise and went down that same path with this. Um, and I felt like that was the right place to be for this specific type of thing. Because I feel like if you get to that point where the pressure's at a seven or an eight, you know, in terms of the Borg scale, and sometimes there was in too much discomfort to really get to that good zone right away. If we think of, you know, and we've had some examples, John T., in these last weeks of, of, of a fellow colleague of, of Steve and myself, a swim coach working with people who are, uh, was a gentleman who had a stroke, Steve, I believe, yeah. and yes. was able yeah. to move for the first time in, in 10 years. So I'm thinking as we get older, um, and, and, you know, thinking of my own parents, as my mom says, she, can, she loves to walk and she just feels like, her, she wants to walk that far, but she just, she, she can't. So I'm thinking if I just start to have her walk with the katsu bands on, you know, is it the same thing where she's going to train her brain and it's the race pain that I talk about her, her walk brain to be able to, when she gets tired to be able to actually go further because her brain knows it can go further. I, I don't know if that made sense. I, I, I just, I put the katsu on her before she did the walk. Yeah, I'd prep her for the walk. I wouldn't walk with them on. Yes, I'm putting together. I don't know if it will be a book book, you know, because I'm just uh, thinking about how to disseminate information into the media environments and, and the people today. It might really ultimately just be a website, uh, brain training for swimmers that um, then you can go in and pick and choose what you want to kind of look at. If I want to understand how to freestyle or this or brain training or contrast training then you go and get what you want you know you go you might say get the book or you might get parts of the book or you might just get one section type of thing i mean i, I don't i think the predisposition for people younger people today is have a hard time sitting down reading through a book you know so the idea is if they can get something that they can sit down and absorb yep. and, and gather in 10 to 20 minutes of reading i think that the value in that is much higher and they have something right there and then they can take and and and, and act upon uh, within the, the space of a day as opposed to going through a whole book and you know i find sometimes people get sidetracked when they get into a book and all of a sudden you know they don't even read the rest of the book because they get sidetracked in the first chapter and you know, they're off and running. So this way it will be kind of like a, maybe a piecemeal kind of thing.